now we have the pleasure of having Eric Perkins to tell us about ADS3. Thanks a lot, Juan. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak at this really nice conference. I'm excited to talk about some work from the summer with my student and postdoc applicant, Gabriele Diubaldo, uh, about a paper of the same name. <clears throat> um, we also benefited a lot from discussions with Scott Collier, which are ongoing. Um, and the paper aims to answer a question, which I think has been raised in a few contexts uh, over and over, ADS black holes, CFT uh, bootstrap context. And the question is, is there a random matrix theory for conformal field theory? <clears throat> so as we all know, JT gravity is dual to an ensemble of random matrices as established in this paper. And that duality has space-time wormholes, but no factorization problem because of the presence of an ensemble on the boundary. <clears throat> but it raises questions for higher dimensional holography uh, with which we're all familiar. Uh, the way I see it, the main questions are as follows. First, ADS CFT works. So how do we interpret space-time wormholes from the CFT point of view? Uh, do we need ensembles? How does that remain compatible with what we thought we knew? And the second question is that black hole microstates in any dimension uh, not just ADS2 physics, uh, should, in an, in an appropriate sense, exhibit random matrix statistics. But in what sense, and from the CFT point of view, in more than uh, one dimension, how do we find these random matrices? So today we'll talk about ADS3 CFT2. CFT2s must obey various consistency conditions, prime among them the Virasoro symmetry, and the SL2Z invariance of the partition function and more generally covariance of local observables on the torus. <clears throat> An old question that the bootstrap community has uh, addressed and really going back to the work of, of Cardi is how does the bootstrap constrain the heavy spectrum of a CFT on average? That is in some integrated sense over some window of energies. <clears throat> this is the realm of the Cardi formula, various asymptotic expansions that have been done for OPE data and modular kernels, and so on. But a new question, relatively speaking, that the bootstrap really has yet to answer, is how does the bootstrap constrain the heavy spectral correlations, the fine structure of the asymptotic spectrum? And this is where chaos and random matrices live. <clears throat> There's some important context for this problem provided by the ADS3 pure gravity problem, the simplest, simplest version of which is the following. Just find a consistent semi-classical partition function with a single torus boundary for a theory that would contain only gravitons and black holes. <clears throat> so famously, the natural prescription for how to compute this partition function, Z grav, which is to sum over smooth saddles with torus boundary, fails. It gives you a highly non-unitary density of states. And so to this, if we are to preserve the purity of the problem, that is to not add matter or light strings or something like this, there needs to be some other contribution to the partition function that I'm just going to call Z off shell because if we don't want to add matter, then it's some geometric thing which contributes to the path integral or perhaps something non-geometric, I suppose, but let's just call it Z off shell. And we don't know much about what that, what that is. <clears throat> so is there a solution to this problem without adding stuff? And how might the answer be informed by holographic duality in one lower dimension? <clears throat> so let's ask ourselves what we should ask ourselves. Now, JT gravity is dual to a random matrix ensemble, and there are two components to the right-hand side of this equation. There's the random matrix, and there's the ensemble. So a lot of recent work has focused on the ensemble part, as it were, studying the holographic interpretation of wormhole saddles in ADS-3 with arbitrary fixed topology. And there's a very rich story there, which can be summarized as follows. The saddle point partition functions are moments of a large C ensemble of CFT data. Uh, this can be computed also by this novel TQFT, this Virasoro TQFD, uh, again, for on-trail solutions with any number of boundaries and handles. The ensemble data is fixed by the vacuum plus crossing symmetry. 
And so it's probing the universality of asymptotic CFT data and not the chaos of the black hole spectrum of the theory. At a fundamental level, I find it unclear what to make of ensemble interpretations. The phenomenon that we need to explain is apparent averaging, as was articulated in this paper, which we will return to later. On the other hand, it's the random matrix side, which we have strong hints should be present in any dimension in ADS-CFT. This is where the black holes live. And so I would submit that we need to understand the random matrix dynamics in ADS-CFT in general. And today, uh, we'll try to do that in ADS-3-CFT2 in particular. And that this is the heart of the ADS-3 pure gravity problem. <clears throat> so with this kind of motivation, Cutler and Jensen computed the two boundary torus wormhole in ADS-3 pure gravity. The somewhat mysterious computation, certainly unfamiliar because it's not a saddle point. And there was some indication of some uh, level repulsion in the um, dual CFT spectrum. And they, they termed this, uh, they, they coined this term random CFT to describe what they seem to be observing as phenomenological features of their answer, which was something like random matrix theory. I mentioned the level repulsion. It seems to be computing something like a density two point correlator uh, in microcanonical language. But there are questions about what this means. What is this thing on the boundary, which seems to be correlated by this smooth space-time wormhole? What exactly is the? <clears throat> what do these brackets mean? If we have a boundary CFT, what kind of averaging is being done? And above all, what is the word, the, the phrase random CFT really supposed to mean? So we'll try to answer this today with a framework for random matrix dynamics in bona fide CFT2. Uh, this is not a model. These are techniques that apply to generic 2D CFTs. And they come from thinking about modular invariance and chaos in a new way. And if we apply them to the ADS3 pure gravity problem, we can give a microscopic explanation and indeed a factorization of the Collar Jensen wormhole. <clears throat> so the claim is that if one accepts this framework, then the CFT dual to ADS3 pure gravity has a piece of the partition function which we can determine by factorization, which augments the sum over saddles. It's something we call ZRMT. There's an explicit formula for it, and we will return to this later. But schematically, right, physically, what is contained in here is some leading order piece of the quantum substructure of the black hole microstate spectrum in pure gravity. Okay, so. The outline for the rest of the talk is the following. First, I'll present this uh, 2D CFT trace formula, which glues everything together. This will lead us to a criterion for when a 2D CFT exhibits random matrix universality in the sense of having a linear ramp in the spectral form factor. Uh, we'll then turn to the large C realm and pure gravity and talk about the color Jensen wormhole and the, the black hole microstates. So the first half of the talk will be at arbitrary C, and then we'll move to, to large C and gravity. If we want to talk about chaos and random matrices in 2D CFT, then the first thing we have to address is the lack of a precise definition of the chaotic part of a 2D CFT spectrum. So it should somehow involve the heavy states, but uh, we'd like to be more precise than that. And when we think about holography for ADS-3 black holes uh, and handle bodies, there's some suggestion for what this chaotic threshold should be, albeit in a large C semi-classical limit. Whatever the definition is, ideally, it ought to respect the modular invariance of the theory. And so in some sense, we want to ask about how these chaotic statistics up here are related, if at all, to the more regular spectrum that exists down there. And part of the message is actually that while SL2Z does relate light and heavy states, there's kind of a piece of the heavy spectrum which is not so simply related to the light states, and that's actually where the chaos lives. <clears throat> so as was observed in this paper from uh, a couple of years ago, the primary partition function, that is the, the primary counting partition function of a 2D CFT with no extra currents, and let's take C greater than one, can be written like so. So the primary partition function I'm calling ZP, you just take your partition function, you strip off the descendants in the usual way while preserving modular invariance by multiplying by a factor of root in tau, where I'm defining tau as x plus iy. So the, 
the partition function can be written as a sum of two pieces. They're both modular invariant. And I'm going to call these z smooth and z chaotic, but we'll sort of back off from that and try to argue or prove that this really is the right characterization. But I want you to think of it in, these, in, in this way. So what is the smooth piece? The smooth piece is the sum of all light states in the theory and their modular images under SL2Z. So what that means is sum up all the states where I'm defining light to mean that the twist is bounded above by C minus one over 12. And for each such state, add all of the modular images under SL2Z. We can complete this minimally by just adding all the images and nothing more. This defines a Poincaré sum of this thing Z light, and that whole thing is what I'm calling Z smooth. So this by construction is modular invariant. What's left is what I want you to think of as the chaotic part of the partition function. It's the piece that's not fixed by the low energy data, that is the light data, plus the states that need to be there because of modular invariance. It has support only on states above this threshold, C minus one over 24, if we're talking about H or H bar individually. And this is of course familiar as the semi-classical black hole regime in gravity. But again, here we're working at finite C. So as a formal statement, you can split the partition function this way. <clears throat> now, let me change notation to what we actually used in the paper. I don't wanna put the cart before the horse. I'm trying to show you that this split is physically what I'm telling you it is. So in the paper, we call this first piece Z hat light. That's the modular completion of light stuff. And the second piece Z spec for reasons that will become clear in a moment. Now, as I said before, what is this first piece? It's the low energy data plus all the heavy states that must be there due to modular invariance. It looks self-averaging. Why do I say this? Well, one reason is that if you do this kind of computation in Narain CFT, you can show that averaging over the moduli of the theory sets this extra piece to zero. So this suggests that even in a generic Virasoro CFT with no moduli, Z spec contains the chaotic fluctuations, which would average to zero over some appropriate uh, sense of average. So we're seeking a precise sense in which Z spec is chaotic. If we'd like to talk about the density of states, well, that splits into two pieces likewise. So here's a picture for how to think about what I've said. Suppose we have some exact density rho of T where T is just some shifted uh, twist. <clears throat> This dark curve is an approximation to an exact density. At finite C, the density of the theory of a compact theory would be discrete. But here, imagine you're at some large C theory or, where the gaps are shrinking. So this, this curve is an approximation to an exact uh, density of a, of, a, of a microscopic CFT. This row hat light is this continuous exponential smooth approximation to this data. That's this dashed line here. Think of this as the Cardi formula plus corrections to that from other light states. And what's in between is rho spec. In order for the exact density to have this decomposition, rho spec must oscillate on scales e to the minus cardi. And so you have this kind of picture for what, what that piece of the density of states contains. Okay. Here I've pictured it as the square root edge to evoke uh, the Cardi formula. So this hints at an analogy with the Gutzwiller trace formula for quantum systems, which in a nutshell is the following. If we have some spectral density rho, we can split it into a rho bar, a mean density, and what's usually called this oscillatory piece, rho os. And the oscillatory term can be recast as a sum over semi-classical periodic orbits. Gamma labels the orbits as an e to the i orbit action times the period, which is the derivative of the orbit action with respect to energy, so I'm some determinant factor here. And so the analogy with what I've said is that this mean density is like this rho hat light, and this oscillatory density is like this rho spec. So we'd like to make this concrete, and remarkably there's a presentation of rho spec which realizes precisely this, and that presentation explains why we call this rho spec. Okay. So referring to the partition function now, z spec, is by construction a square integrable SL2Z invariant function. It's square integrable because we've taken the original partition function, subtracted out all the light states, and those are the ones that grow exponentially as you approach the cusp at infinity. 
And such functions admit a unique decomposition into a complete invariant eigenbasis, the details of which aren't super important because ultimately we're going to go back to the density of states. But just to put this up here, there's a constant piece. There's an Eisenstein series that's a continuous branch where this is evaluated on the critical line, where S, this parameter, is a half plus I omega. And there's an infinite set of discrete eigenfunctions known as mass cusp forms. There's a lot of interesting math and physics here. Uh, and some nice papers have, have uh, mined this. Um, I'd like to point out this paper here, which thinks about this decomposition also in the context of ADS3 CFT2, and in some sense is complementary to, to what I'm saying today. So this is a nifty tool, but what does it have to do with periodic orbits? And the key idea is to pass back to the density of states. So if we decompose rho spec in this basis, it turns out the eigenbasis elements are in a correspondence to periodic orbits in the sense that the formula for these eigenbasis elements in the microeconomical language is just of the form of an orbit. So you have an e to the i orbit action times a period times this prefactor, where these are the explicit formulas for those identifications. And these are unique if we demand that the action is real for real omega, and that as we take the spin j to zero, you get a smooth limit to the correct answer for what these basis elements are. So this is just a, a technical statement. This, this is true. And clearly, it has the form of a Goodswiller trace formula-like object now for a 2D CFT piece of the density. So these orbits are defined with respect to the same operator for any CFT. It's just a, a function of the modular invariance of the theory. And the piece that is theory dependent are the overlaps, which you should think of as orbit degeneracies. That interpretation is a little iffy because it's actually, it's easy to see they're not always positive. For example, the C equals one free boson, you can compute these and they're not always positive. So the interpretation as a degeneracy is a little bit funny, but I mean, so is the existence of this formula actually a bit, a bit surprising and, and mysterious. So that's just some feature of the 2D CFT avatar of the trace formula. <clears throat> More to the point for now, it gives us a path to establishing random matrix universality in 2D CFTs. We just do what people do with Goodswiller. So first, we want to define an analog of Barry's diagonal approximation to a two-copy observable, namely the spectral form factor, a product of partition functions. And then we can extract from this a condition for that to have a linear ramp. And the condition can be phrased as a statement about these overlaps. So what does it mean to have the diagonal approximation? Well, that's a pairing of orbits. For us, the orbits are the eigenfunctions. So we just want to pair the eigenfunctions. In another, so we start with a factorized product. You, you imagine dropping all off diagonal terms. That is, by definition, the diagonal approximation to that product. Right? And so the right-hand side of this is diagonal in this SL2Z eigenspace. So this is our diagonal approximation to a factorized product of Z specs. And we call this Z Hecke. The reason is that if you want to get this from the factorized product, you can get it by projecting onto the kernel of the difference of Hecke operators acting on these eigenfunctions. I'm not gonna spend too much time talking about this, although I think it's interesting to uh, people of a certain taste. Um, the Hecke operators, acting on these eigenfunctions spit out Fourier coefficients of spin J, where J labels the Hecke operator. And so if we insist that the action of this thing vanishes on the factorized product, well, that pairs the SL2Z eigenfunctions. We don't fully understand how to get this in the sense of coarse graining, say, over energies. If you coarse grain over energies, you pair eigenvalues, but the cusp forms sit on the critical line. So there are degeneracies between cusp forms and Eigen and Eisenstein series at those values where the cusp forms live. So to kill these cross terms, you need to use this Hecke projection, but it'd like, we'd like to understand this better from the, from the micro, micro canonical point of view of course granting. <clears throat> okay, so with this in hand, we want to ask about random matrix universality. So for simplicity, let's focus on the scalar scalar mode under the Fourier decomposition with respect to the real parts of tau one and tau two. And we will take a low temperature limit, which is where we expect this behavior to hold. Remember y is m tau. So we're gonna take y one and y two to infinity, beta one and beta two to infinity in a fixed ratio. 
you can show that this takes the following form. The leading term is R times root Z times this capital R of Z, where that in terms of this overlap is just the inverse Mellon transform of the square of this overlap of Z spec with the Eisenstein series. The cusp forms drop out of this calculation because we're looking at the scalar mode. And there are corrections to this in the high temperature or the low temperature limit uh, from SL to Z, but they're suppressed. Okay, so modular invariance means there are other terms here, um, but they don't matter in this limit. Okay, you can actually, this function R fixes the entire scalar mode at arbitrary temperatures. In other words, these corrections are fixed by this same function. So given the overlaps, that fixes the whole, the whole thing. And R of Z is just this particular integral transform that pops out when you plug in the zero modes of the Eisenstein series. Okay, so here's, here's the, the main point. We constructed this, you know, by definition as a diagonal approximation to the product. So in the ramp region of the spectral form factor, this Z Heke, well, it is the spectral form factor. And so we can ask, what does it take for this to exhibit a ramp? This being fixed in terms of this microscopic overlap of the theory, it ends up being a condition on that overlap. You go through a calculation, the output is this. So an infinity in spectral space, there must be an exponential decay times some function f of omega, which at large omega asymptotes to a constant. I've written it this way to be careful, but so, you know, at infinity, this just goes to a constant, namely the constant that sets the ramp, but you can have some oscillatory behavior uh, all the way out to infinity, okay? And morally speaking, this is just the slope of the ramp. Note that convergence of the spectral decomposition only requires that this has a power law fall off. So this is a, a condition of rapid decay encoding the chaos of the underlying theory. So as a cartoon, how do we find the random matrices in the 2D CFT in the sense of the random matrix universality as indicated by a linear ramp? You start with your partition function, you isolate the chaotic spectrum in the way that I prescribed. We diagonalize the two-point correlation. And then we go to SFF kinematics, study the spectral form factor, and demand that there's a ramp. And we get this condition. <clears throat> All right, some comments. The first is that modular invariance seems to know about the fine structure of the chaotic spectrum. The second is that C minus 1 over 12 has a sharp physical meaning, even though we're at finite C. It is the threshold below which the states and the modular images are effectively non-chaotic. This threshold is sharp from the point of view of the spectral decomposition. And finally, with this chaos condition or ramp condition, we can try to address a pervasive belief in the field, which is that generic irrational 2D CFTs are chaotic. So what exactly does this mean? Well, arguably this is a tautological statement previously because we didn't have an independent definition of chaos. You have some er erratic sporadic spectrum of primaries, you know, that we all understand why one would think that this must be chaotic, but it'd be nice to have an independent definition to put some meat on this. And now we do. So we can ask if that's true by inputting it into a bootstrap problem. So the question for the future, and certainly I can answer this today is, if we impose unitarity, there are symmetry, C greater than one. And if we forbid this condition from being satisfied on the solutions, are there any solutions at all? It'd be nice to answer this question. Okay. So now we transition to gravity. Now recall a familiar feature of ADS-3 holography from the black hole fairy tale, say, which is that the bulk invariant under large diffeomorphisms in the semi-classical theory manifests itself as a sum over geometries, uh, which implements the boundary modular invariance. So with this perspective, we're going to motivate a working geometric definition of a torus wormhole amplitude. So we're gonna define Z wormhole as a sum of this form, where the seed is invariant under simultaneous modular transformations with respect to tau one and tau two, and so if we sum over relative transformations, the whole thing will be fully invariant independently with respect to tau one and tau two. This is just a definition of what we're going to mean by torus wormhole. And you can prove that these types of functions have some special properties. <clears throat> the main one I want to highlight, well, it's 
there are two, one of them is implicit here. You can show that in the spectral language, functions of this form take this form in the spectral decomposition. They are, first of all, Hecke symmetric, that is, the eigenfunctions are paired. And second of all, the overlaps sitting in front are the same for the Eisenstein and the cusp form pieces. So we haven't talked so much about the cusp forms, what they mean, but just recall that in previously this and this were independent functions, but for wormholes, they are the same function. And indeed, this function is totally fixed by the scalar Fourier mode at low temperature. That's what we called this R of Z before. So these are highly symmetric functions in this class of two boundary, uh, two copy partition functions. This holds together nicely in view of what we learned from JTRMT. This basis is the one that diagonalizes the correlations and wormholes geometrize the diagonal approximation. So in view of this, we propose a wormhole fairy tale, I'll call it, that is a CFT interpretation of what an amplitude like this is supposed to mean, which is the following. To interpret this amplitude microscopically, we want to identify the overlap that one finds in such an amplitude with the square of the spectral overlap of an underlying microscopic CFT. So given a wormhole, you can extract that. And so now let's do this with the collar Jensen wormhole. <clears throat> so the collar Jensen wormhole amplitude is in this language written as a Poincare sum where the seed is the simple function. It's the inverse chordal distance on hyperbolic space. So what are some notable features of this? The first is that it was computed using an unfamiliar method of constrained gravitational instantons. They had to do this because it's not a saddle point as we mentioned before. And notably this amplitude is independent of G Newton. So their answer had no dependence on the central charge, which is interesting and puzzling and reflects the fact that it's not a saddle point. Okay, so let's process this in the language that we've presented. In spectral space, here's the amplitude. It has this diagonal form as promised with very simple spectral overlaps. And if we ask, what is this R of Z, this thing controlling the, the scalar mode of the, um, of the amplitude, it's just this one over one plus Z. Now, one over one plus Z, when you go to SFF kinematics is exactly the behavior that any two copy partition function must have as it approaches the ramp regime. But here the entire amplitude is just the ramp piece, not just asymptotically at late times, but in this language as Z approaches minus one. Right, Z was beta one over beta two, so that's beta plus IT over beta minus IT. Got a large T that, that goes to minus one, right? So this thing is exactly the ramp, let's say. <clears throat> in this sense, the collar Jensen wormhole is extremal. So I mean this in, in a quantitative way, right? We, we've taken care of all the symmetries, VR Soro and SL2Z. And what's left is this free function R of Z. And it's exactly equal to the double scaled RMT result for the same quantity. So we called the extremal statistics of ADS-3 pure gravity max RMT, which in other words, is the maximal realization of random matrix universality that's consistent with Virasoro and modular invariance. Let's say this in a couple more ways. You can sort of roughly speaking say the BTZ microstate spectrum in pure gravity is as random as possible in the sense of having the least departure from pure RMT statistics. There are deviations from RMT, because of modular invariance, right? R of Z was this piece. There were other spin modes, those subleading corrections at low temperature, but those are all due to Virasoro and SL2Z, not due to dynamics. We can also phrase this as the statement that pure gravity is maximally chaotic, not just at early times where say times logarithmic and the entropy, you have this Lyapunov behavior, but here also at late times where we're in this RMT regime where the times are exponential in the entropy. And pure gravity is maximally chaotic in this sense. I'd also say this lends some kind of support to this mysterious Cutler-Jensen Cutler -Jensen computation. 
it lends support in the sense that within the framework of how to talk about random matrix dynamics in 2D CFT, you might ask, what is the extremal amplitude? And it's this one. And that clicks with how we think about, about pure gravity. So I'd say it gives some kind of indirect support for the validity of their computation, which otherwise is a bit unfamiliar. Okay, another comment. Let's return to this point here, the fact that it's independent of G Newton. This gives a kind of explanation. First of all, the ramp is C independent, right? The slope of the ramp is just a number dictated by the random matrix ensemble, one, two, four. But as we discussed, the symmetries of wormholes are so strong that the ramp fixes the entire amplitude. So the whole amplitude is independent of C. Some more comments. So let me emphasize this wormhole admits a microscopic CFT interpretation. And I want to view this as a kind of realization of the apparent averaging phenomenon introduced by Schlenker and Witten, which roughly speaking, put forth the idea uh, as follows. When we talk about holography, we really are talking about a sequence of, central, of CFTs with ever increasing central charge and taking a large C limit. Now, in a large C limit, there's a difference between the actual discrete sequence of theories and the smooth large C approximation to them and their data. And this difference is what leads CFT observables involving heavy operators, black hole states whose dimensions depend on C, to look random. And what semi-classical gravity is computing are their moments. So what we've shown is a dynamical mechanism for that in 2D CFT. The wormhole looks ensemble but it emerges dynamically from chaos of the underlying theory. Okay, so in the last few minutes, let me talk about factorizing this thing. <clears throat> right now, now we apply the wormhole fairy tale. We identify the overlap in the spectral decomposition with the square of this microscopic CFT data. And so we can pull that out of the amplitude. Here's a picture. I think it's self-explanatory. So let's call the thing ZRMT, which when you square it and glue it appropriately, gives you the wormhole. So we can read this off from the wormhole amplitude. So here with the amplitude written in a slightly different language. So these things here are just the squared overlaps. And this defines for us ZRMT. In other words, the gravity partition function is the MWK piece plus a new piece that we called ZRMT, which I just gave the formula for in the spectral decomposition. The first term sums over smooth saddles. And the second term encodes the leading RMT-like fluctuations of the black hole spectrum. So in this picture from before, our RMT is this leading order approximation to the green stuff between these two lines. Right. Two comments on signs. So you might have noticed this derivation by factorization can't fix the overall signs of the overlaps. We extracted them squared, right? Can we fix this? We haven't been able to definitively fix the signs. But the trace formula loosely suggests that it's the positive branch that is the right one, because if we think of these as orbit degeneracies, then that's the physical interpretation. That remains to be proven. Nevertheless, whatever the sign, it's intriguing that the overlap is sign definite on the critical line, because neither function is independently sign definite on the fundamental domain. When we take their inner product, there's no reason to expect that the result will always be positive for all values of this parameter. So thinking about wormholes in, in uh, holography suggests that all large C CFTs obey this bootstrap constraint, that this constraint on their chaotic spectra always holds. It would be nice to think more about this. So returning to this cartoon from before and applying it to ADS-3 pure gravity, in ADS-3 pure gravity, we interpret this Kotler jensen amplitude as this diagonal approximation to this product. And from there, we factorize and extract ZRMT, this microscopic leading piece of the fluctuating spectrum. <clears throat> now, we have not solved the pure gravity problem. If the Kotler Jensen wormhole were fully non perturbative, then perhaps we would have, but it isn't, and we don't have a complete proposal. From the wormhole point of view, 
The reason is that Kotler Jensen, aka the Taurus wormhole with no interior topology, if you will, is expected to be the first of an infinite series of off-shell contributions to the two boundary partition function. Here I've pictured one where roughly speaking, we have some handles in the middle, let's say. Just, uh, this is my last slide, so I'm gonna wait for that to do its beeping thing and then keep talking. Great. So there should be other wormhole contributions, which if one factorized them, would give you further pieces to the single boundary partition function. And those further pieces would capture further non-perturbative bulk effects, which presumably, although not yet proven, are suppressed exponentially in uh, central charge. <clears throat> From this point of view, we, we can argue that, first of all, as I said before, unitarity requires that this piece is non-zero. This gives some kind of independent motivation for why these wormholes should contribute. And second of all, this also shows you that the semi-classical black hole threshold in pure gravity is strictly below C minus one over 12. I don't have so much time to go into this, but the argument is simple. If there were no other states below C minus one over 12, then when you subtracted them out and performed the large C expansion, uh, you should get something unitary. But as we said before, this plus this is not unitary. So there's some kind of order of limits issue. There needs to be other stuff just below the threshold, uh, which restores unitarity, if you like. And this was implicit in the proposal of Maxfield and Teriyachi, who gave a kind of partial explanation for how this shift in the threshold by an exponentially small amount might happen. Okay, so to conclude, let me mention a few questions among many. Um, in the bulk, of course, we should try to derive these non-perturbative RMT statistics from off-shell geometries, including this ZRMT, which we did not derive from a direct single boundary computation. ZRMT presents a target for the random tensor model of uh, Bellin et al. Perhaps this should have, been a, should have been a boundary challenge, but nevertheless, uh, the challenge is to derive ZRMT from that model. On the boundary, we can pursue a classification of randomness in CFT2, by which I mean to try to stratify the space of 2D CFTs into those which are, say, extremal, like the one that would be dual to pure gravity, and those that are have a ramp, but otherwise have some large functional departure from that as you move away from the late time limit. It'd be nice to understand this, this better. Of course, we should try to continue to construct a candidate partition function that not just has this piece, but now has this piece. And finally, from the bootstrap point of view, I think there's some sort of next generation bootstrap to be developed, which would answer the question, how do we incorporate random matrix statistics into the bootstrapping of the heavy spectrum. And with that, I'll conclude. Thanks. Thanks, Eric. Um, so one thing I'm afraid I missed in the first part of the talk, pre-gravity, where does the threshold C minus one over 24 come into the analysis there? It comes in because the states with, with dimension delta less than C minus one over 12 give contributions to the partition function, which diverge exponentially at large M tau. And so from the point of view of wanting to perform a spectral decomposition, you need to get rid of those states because the decomposition only applies to suitably well-behaved, AKA finite norm functions on the fundamental domain. So from that technical point of view, there's this difference between states below and states above. Now, we define Z light in terms of H and H bar, not the sum. So actually we're doing something a little more than what one needs to do mathematically to define light here. And that's motivated by trying to ask what are the chaotic states? And I think justified after the fact by the existence of this, this trace formula. Um, I hope that answers the question. Um, forgive me if this is a naive question. Uh, at one point you had a picture which looked a lot like that one that you said was self-explanatory. And one of the directions said coarse grain, which implied to me that you're forgetting or throwing out information. 
but then there's a other direction arrow that said factorize. So how can you go the other way around if you're forgetting stuff in the first place? Yes. Um, yeah, it's not so explanatory. Right? Um, <laughs> yeah. So uh, the reason that you can go back is that this set of periodic bits that's relevant for the 2D CFT trace formula forms a complete eigenbasis. So from the diagonal approximation to it, you can extract the orbit actions that canceled each other in the factorized thing because they are labeled by some eigenvalue where the orbit action is determined just by symmetry. Does that mean that you're not actually coarse graining? Uh, no, I would say that we are in the sense that you land on the Thing where the eigenfunctions are paired, where the orbits are paired, by starting from something where they are not. Um, as I said, I think trying to understand this better from the yeah fr from the point of view of um, microcanonical coarse graining or some version thereof would help understand better the robustness of this formula. And for example, the the relevant time scales in in a in a CFT where this actually is a valid approximation. I have a question, which maybe is the same question, but it's, can you say more about the signs that you said were ambiguous? Because I would have thought that, that you need them to be wildly oscillating in order to agree with the semi-classical description in the bulk. But I think you said that you expect them all to be plus signs or something. And, it, and a second part of the question is, why were they just signs as opposed to phases? I would have thought if you do a diagonal approximation, you have an undetermined phase. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so let me go back to that. <clears throat> so there's there's a the, the short answer about the phase is that symmetry is strong enough that it just is a sign. So this is so I've written things here in terms of the so-called completed Eisenstein series, which is invariant under s goes to one minus s. And when you write the decomposition in terms of that guy, then the coefficient is literally the square, not the mod square of this overlap. These brackets are here because it's the inner product divided by a factor of the completed Riemann zeta function to make this thing itself reflection symmetric under s goes to one minus s. So this is just the square, so there's no phase. On the critical line, yes. So, so yeah. yeah. Um, same here. Um, the first part of your question was: You said you expect that you should just be able to pick the plus sign for some reason. Can you no. just say more why? Yeah, sure. I, mean, uh, I was hoping to especially emphasize that we didn't know didn't know the sign, but the reason is that if you view this as a trace formula and you want to view the orbit densities as physical as numbers, they should be positive numbers. But we know that's not true in general. So this argument is a little flimsy. However, a large C, which is where we're doing this computation, uh, perhaps that's true. So in other words, there is a definite sign to this overlap. And it's one or the other. And this argument suggests that maybe it's the positive sign. But I don't know. See it in the torus partition function if they were all adding up in phase. Um, By they were all, you mean all the basis elements? Uh, what do you mean? If, well, if, the, if they're not oscillating, then uh, they would produce a big effect in the, in the spectrum, I would think. Maybe not. I, well, so there's a, I'm mostly talking about the sign issue here, but there's also a sign issue here for, for each of these overlaps. So, so it could be that. I mean, there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of signs to determine. It could be that some are positive, some are negative, I guess. Um, I, I don't know, uh, I don't know. But if, if there's a physical intuitive argument that I can come up with, it's this, but let's see, let's see. Okay, let's thank Eric again.